Welcome online church. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All participants, members who are online, God bless you. Everybody in church, God bless you. Give God the Lord praise today for his good and his mercies endure forever. Blessed be the name of the Lord, the Lord who himself has loved us with everlasting love, the Lord whose goodness and mercies follow us every day, the Lord who has redeemed our lives from destruction. Oh, we bless your name. We glorify your name. Hallelujah. With our hands, holy hands lifted up. As you said, let men lift up holy hands everywhere without wrath or doubting. We lift our hands in praise to the Lord God. Like palm branches waving before you, we lift our hands in praise, in honor, in worship and adoration. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for healing. Thank you for deliverance. Thank you. For your blessings that make rich, to which you add no sorrow. Thank you for glory. Thank you for sanctification. Thank you for wisdom. Christ has made unto us wisdom from God. He is made unto us redemption. He is made unto us sanctification. He is made unto us righteousness. Thank you. Thank you for calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light, Lord, to show forth the praises, the excellencies of the living God. And so with holy hands lifted up today in the sanctuary, in homes around the world, we praise you as it was done on that Palm Sunday, the week before the resurrection of Jesus. We lift up our hands, even that we open the palms of our hands in worship to the Lord and say, Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. Somebody in your home, somebody somewhere in the world, someone in the sanctuary, open up those palms to the Lord and wave them before the Lord in thanksgiving, in appreciation for his love. Oh, hallelujah. And lift your hands, knowing that you are liberated. You are de delivered. He has emancipated us. Glory be to God. We are called out of darkness into his marvelous light, into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus, to show forth the praises of the Lord. And so I lift up my hands, and I praise you. I lift up hands in the sanctuary, and I praise you. I join your prayer people of God, the saints of God, the holy saints of God, and we say thank you for saving us. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for delivering us. Thank you for being with us. Through every trial, every challenge, every difficulty, you never forsook us. You were with us. Your grace was sufficient, was present, was enough for us, and you've brought us through. Out of the valley to the table land, to the place where you've prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies. They are defeated. They are defeated. They cannot touch us because we are untouchable. We are surrounded by the glory of the Lord. The fire of the Lord is all around us. Your glory is within us. The blood has marked us. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit and so we are invincible. We cannot be defeated. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for causing us to triumph in Christ on the cross and in his resurrection and causing us to triumph in every place by your wisdom. As we walk by your wisdom in the power of the Holy Spirit, you cause us to triumph in every place. In Christ Jesus, for this Lord, we say thank you. And once again on this Palm Sunday, we lift up the righteous hands of God that God has given to us. The hands that God has touched. According to Psalm 24, those who will stand before the Lord, who rise before the Lord, are those who have clean hands. Thank you that we are not clean of our own doing and our, ourselves, but we are clean, made clean, washed and sanctified by the blood of Jesus. And so receive praise. By these hands that are raised unto you. These palms that are open to the Lord. We have sworn before the Lord that will not look to man. Not fear the devil. Not look to man, but will look to God. As Abraham lifted up his hands and said, I have sworn that I will not look to man, nor take from man, but from God alone. With these hands I stretch to you. We say, we also as children of Abraham say, Lord, 
We look not to man. We trust not in the arm of flesh. But our trust is in you. Our trust is in you. Our trust is in you. And so we cry, Hosanna to God. Hosanna. Hosanna to the Lord. Hosanna to the Lord. Hosanna to the Lord. Save us and send now prosperity. Send now peace. Send now health. Send now vigor and vitality. Send now your grace. Send now that we which we need, even the shalom of God, where nothing is missing, nothing is broken, but we are whole. Receive our praise. Receive the glory that is due you, Lord, in the highest name. Ah, in the highest name, the name that is above every name, this name that you gave Jesus. At the mention of which every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ alone is Lord. Yeshua HaMashiach alone is Lord to the glory of God. In this matchless name, Jesus, we say, praise the Lord. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. And amen. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. Give him praise. Clap your hands, all ye people. The Bible says, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. That's right. Go ahead and clap your hands. Amen. Even those at home, we can't see you, but you can right now express that. The Bible says, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Can somebody give the Lord a shout of victory? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the Christian faith, traditionally, of course, today is Palm Sunday. Amen. And we just want to, before you take your seat, wherever you are in the sanctuary or in the world, uh, somewhere in the world, before we get into God's word, let's just do what they did. You know, they were shouting to the Lord on that Palm Sunday. They were just appreciating Jesus. They were saying, welcome. They were saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the Messiah who comes in the name of the Lord. They were expressing it. Jesus didn't ask for it, but when they saw Jesus entering Jerusalem, the people just began. They went wild. Amen. Do you have a team you support, like a basketball team, a football team? You know, some, somebody you support, you know, that wins a game. How do you feel and how do you react? Now, Jesus saved us. Jesus delivered us. We are on the winning side. And so all around the world, one more time, give the Lord a shout, somebody, and clap your hands. Hallelujah. You can wave your hand. You can shout. You can clap your hands. I just want you to express freedom before the Lord. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo, glory. Glory at you. Glory be to God. Somebody say glory be to God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. You can say that in the sanctuary and wherever you are in the world. You can say it in French, in English, in Spanish, in your own language. Just express gratitude to God. Glory be to God. Glory a Dieu. Gloria a Dios. Gloria a Dios. Adieu. Glory be to God. Somebody give me a shout and say to the Lord, glory be to your name. Hallelujah. Woo. Blessed be God. All right. God bless you. Please be seated here in the sanctuary and wherever you are in the world, you may now Take your Bible and turn with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 12. John chapter 12. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Praise God. Pastor Sandra, please do me a favor. I have a Bible on that seat over there, if you can kindly get it for me. Uh, it's in the case. Yes. Hallelujah. John 12 and verse 12. Yes. That one's falling apart, but I prefer it. Thank you. <laughs> it's well used. Hallelujah. So just give me a moment. Let me find Yohanne. John chapter 12. We want to look at verse 12 to 15. I believe it is. What? Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. John 12 and verse 12. Reading from verse 12. On the next day, many people who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees. And we will talk a lot about that today. Trees of righteousness displaying God's splendor. That's my title. Trees of righteousness displaying God's splendor. His splendor as his glory, his glory. Hallelujah. So, John 12, verse 12. On the next day, many people had come to the feast. When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, obviously they knew about him. It was a rabbi who was healing people, delivering people, teaching people about God. And he was a rabbi who actually seemed to prefer, uh, should I say even prefer from their perspective, he preferred the regular people, the normal guys or ladies on the street, uh, as opposed to then, as opposed to the religious people. Uh, the religious leaders were called Sadducees, Pharisees, you know, and of course those who recorded the scriptures to where the scribes. Pharisees and Sadducees in particular, uh, those religious leaders looked down on the people. Jesus came, Jesus hung out with the people. Uh, so people loved him. All right, so when they heard he was coming to Jerusalem, look at what they're doing. They take branches, John 12, 13. They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna. Hosanna means save us. It's a cry for salvation. Amen. They were acknowledging him as the savior, the one of whom the prophets, Old Testament prophets, their own prophets uh, had prophesied would come into the world to save, to save the world. And of course, for them uh, to save them. Uh, obviously, they expected at this time deliverance from the Romans because at the time Jesus was alive, the people of Israel were under the Romans. The Romans. And so they expected, you know, deliverance, natural deliverance, you know, deliverance from physical oppression, uh, more so than thinking about deliverance from spiritual oppression. Because uh, they actually didn't think that they were under spiritual oppression. Because as far as they were concerned, they had God, the Romans did not have God. The Romans and other Gentiles did not have God. And by the way, 
for that matter, they looked down on other Gentiles or people of other nations. As far as their relationship with God was concerned, they felt privileged. They felt that they were better than all other people. So even though you were oppressing them physically, they still thumb their noses at you. They look down on you. In their heart and in their mind, they're like, you're nothing. After all, I have God on my side because we have the law of Moses. You guys don't have that. Are you following me? All right. So the deliverance they were expecting, the salvation they were expecting was not spiritual salvation or spiritual deliverance because they're okay. They think they're okay. You guys are the ones who are bound. They wanted to be free from the Romans and any other people who oppressed them. Now, you got to understand that in their history, in their history, they had been, um, they'd had a lot of battles and they had experienced oppression, you know, in their history. And so this was not, you know, something new to them. They had gone through, you know, uh, some serious challenges from other people, other countries. Uh, Israel itself was born, if you would, was born in, in Africa, in Egypt. Uh, if you believe the Bible, I'm talking about, about the Bible. I'm not talking about any other thing, but I'm a pastor. Obviously, I'm going to talk from the biblical perspective. You know, things go online and people are like, wait a minute. No, 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 I disagree. I disagree. You, you can disagree. That's fine. I'm just talking from the Bible. From the Bible, there were a people in Egypt, which is in Africa, all right? Uh, uh, there's a man called Jacob, whose name God changed from Jacob to Israel, right? And Jacob moves to Egypt to be with his son, Joseph, who at the time was prime minister of Egypt, he comes to Egypt, you know, by like 70 odd people, and eventually he dies. But the, the people who came there as a family, Jacob and his family, now grow to become a whole nation in Egypt. The Pharaoh at the time of uh, Joseph's reign designated an area called Goshen for these people to live in. They were shepherds. Egyptians actually disrespected shepherds and so had no social dealings with them. For that matter, they remained separate. In other words, the, there was no intermarriage between the, the shepherds, these shepherds, and the Egyptians who were higher in the society than them. Are you, does that make sense to you? Okay. Um, but God chose that means to build up the nation of Israel. Uh, are you with me so far? All right. Uh, so they were kind of like secluded in this place in Goshen so they could grow. And now years later, there's a pharaoh who's ruling who realizes, oh, my goodness, there's a nation in my nation. The numbers are astronomical. They have grown in numbers. There's, there's actually a, a nation in my nation. And when you think about it, you know, as far as your survival, your protection, you're like, wait a minute, if they turn against me or if they get some other country to align with them, get in league with them, they can come and defeat me. You know, if Ukraine gets NATO on their side, they're too close to me, I'm Russia. Kind of what we're dealing with today. I did not say I'm for Russia or for Ukraine. It's just an example to help me explain this. So I'm going to leave that subject alone. Amen. But you can relate, right? What we're dealing with today, geopolitical issues, they dealt with back then. There is absolutely nothing new under the sun. 
There is nothing new under the sun. We just go through cycles. What has been shall happen again. And what's happening will happen again. But I'm going to teach you from the scriptures that you can walk with God and ensure that for your life and your generations, good shall follow you. Amen. You will find in the scriptures, God made promises to certain people. You know, for example, to David, God said that I will raise up from your house somebody who will sit on the throne. If God said that to David, God can say that to you because God's not partial. Come at somebody say amen. Amen. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. Okay, so Israel is literally born as a nation within Egypt. Then God goes to deliver them because at the time of their deliverance, there is a Pharaoh who rises up who did not know Joseph and did not care about whatever Joseph had done, how God used Joseph to save Egypt and other nations. He doesn't care. And you actually have to know the reason why. This is from the Bible. This is from the Bible. There's a, a Pharaoh who arose who knew not Joseph. That's what the Bible says. However, the reason why, in case you wonder well, why, how can a Pharaoh arise who does not know Joseph, the history of the Israelites, how they came into his country? How is that possible? Because naturally, naturally, the world doesn't happen work that way. To become a president of a country, you know your country, you know the history of your country. Come on, people, you know it. Yes? Even if you think about modern day, just to get votes, you have to know a little bit. Even if you, you didn't care about your country, to be voted into power, you have to learn a little bit about your country so that you can talk to people and get their votes. Are you with me? If your country people are like Christian people, then you got to start visiting churches to get the Christian vote. So you have to learn a little bit of your history, even if you didn't care about it. You with me so far? Okay. Then the other aspect is, especially if it was a monarchy, there were kings, if it operated, you know, like that, like a monarchy, kings, royalty, you are groomed from when you were a baby to learn about your royal line. You with me so far? For example, uh, is it Prince William in, in England? Is that Prince William? Prince Charles, Prince William, you know, those people, they are groomed. So they know their history. Yes? Even Harry knows the history. <laughs> you understand? Okay. So all the pharaohs knew their history. So how is it that a pharaoh rises who does not know Joseph? It's because that pharaoh was not Egyptian. That pharaoh was not Egyptian. That pharaoh was an Assyrian. Yes. In case you never knew. Now you know. That's why God sent you a teacher. Amen. That's not only history, but that God just put one line in the Bible to tell us. The prophet Isaiah wrote about it. He said, my people went down to Egypt in the past. And listen, listen. He said, and the Assyrian oppressed him. That's, you're like, if you're a student of the Bible, you're like, wait a minute. They went to Egypt, but he said, and the Assyrian oppressed him. That doesn't seem to make sense. Come on, people, stay with me. This is not difficult. God says, my people went down to Egypt. Right? If they got oppressed, you would naturally say they went to Egypt and the Egyptian oppressed them. Yes? Well, isn't that what, well, it makes sense to say that. God didn't say that. He said they went down to Egypt and the Assyrian oppressed them. Come on, you with me? So that means the one who started to oppress the Israelites when they were in Egypt 
was not Egyptian, was Assyrian. That is why he did not know the history. He did not need to know the history to become a pharaoh. He just had to be big enough to beat you up to become a pharaoh. Just so you can relate to this, it's just the same thing as Putin right now, bigger than what's his neighbor called? The neighbor country he's, he's fighting now, invading. Ukraine. If I'm bigger than you, I don't need to learn your history. I don't need to care about you. I'm just bigger than you, so I beat you up and I take your town. Hello? Wrong, but that's just what's happening. Do you get it? Historically, the first empire where the Israelites got oppressed was Egypt. The next empire was Assyria in history. But the scriptures also agree with this. Amen. Okay. And then, of, you know, in history, the next empire that the, Egypt, the Israelites had to deal with were, was the medo persian Empire. It was a combination of the Medes and the Persians. Persia is like Iran. You know, Iran today, Iran, that region is Persia. They're Persians. They're still called Persians today. Okay? All right. So that was the, the next empire that oppressed them. And then came Greece. Remember Alexander the Great of history? Greece. Okay. After the Grecians came the Romans. So the nation Israel <laughs> has had to deal with just trying to survive from, from their very infancy. If you just look at the nascent of Israel, just from their babyhood, just when they were born, they were born fighting. Even when they came out of Egypt through the Exodus, remember the Red Sea? Right after that, they're fighting. You got Edomites against them. You got Moabites against them. What is actually strange about all this is that a lot of the time it was their cousins who were fighting them. It's just relatives who are fighting them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now fast forward, we come to this time when Israel is under Rome and Jesus has been born. He grows up, he starts his ministry revealing God to them. He's healing the sick delivering the oppressed, he's loving, he's kind, he appreciates the regular folk, spend, spends time with them. In fact, religious people condemn him for spending time with sinners, people they consider sinners. If you're a rabbi, you should be hanging out with us in the temple. How come, you know, you eat with sinners and, and all that? I've actually always appreciated this and wondered about it and prayed that we would have it in our generation, this. In Jesus' time, the street guys, the regular folk, were always rushing to hear from him. Today, the regular folk don't want to go to church. Why is something is wrong, people? We got to examine this thing. Why is it that a lot of the time, people you work with or people you live around you or people who know you, know Bible-thumping people, don't want to be around them. Why is that? Is it because we're too religious? I'm just getting you to think. Because in Jesus' time, people who I would say like hated to go to church, they were always running to Jesus. May you be like Jesus. Amen? I mean, people, we, we ought to search it out. And we, we ought to make sure that unbelievers like to hang around us. I'm not saying this to boast, but I have unbelievers who are comfortable around me. I'm not saying this to boast. They are comfortable around me. They know who I am. They know my position. They know I'm a pastor. They know I'm a minister. But they don't run away from me. Seriously. 
because I'm not quoting scriptures at them. No. I talk to them like normal, regular person. Amen. You should be able to do that. You should be able to live as Christ in the dark world, shining as lights. Amen. Being used by God to bring them life and light, that they would be willing to come to you when they are in trouble. They'll even ask you for prayer when they are desperate. Amen. And not feel like, you know, you're going to tell them to read a thousand verses. There was something about Jesus that made people want to come to Jesus. What was it that made these regular people stay away from the Pharisees and the religious leaders? Yet, they were comfortable being with Jesus. And Jesus never compromised. According to scripture, he never sinned. There was no guile ever out of his mouth. I mean, how is it that you hang around 14th, well, for, it's no longer 14th Street, you know, red light district, yeah? How, how, how is it that you got to hang around prostitutes and you never utter a cuss word? Do you know right now it's, it's easy to cuss in America because presidents do it, Congress people do it, every, your boss does it, everybody does it. The only people we are not allowed to do it is our children. Yet our children hear us do it all the time. Isn't that confusing though? I don't mean your children. You're different. Come on, smile. I can't see your smile in your, your, your uh, mask, but your eyes will smile. Amen? Okay. In case you are not included, then you need to repent. Included in the group whose children know you never cuss. You need to repent like Isaiah. Amen? Isaiah was a prophet. Isn't that funny? <laughs> this guy, he said, man, he said, when he saw the glory of God in Isaiah 6, and I love God, man. You, you can be messing up. God still says, I love you, and I've chosen you, I've ordained you, and you're going to do what I called you to do. Man, I love God, don't you? In, in Isaiah 6, he sees the glory of God. You know what the first thing he says? He says, oh, my God, I'm coming apart. I am coming apart. I am, I am, I am a sinner. I cuss, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of unclean people. Oh, my God. Like people say, oh, my God, I'm dead. Don't ever say that because dead people don't talk. He says, save me. Say, Hosanna. Amen. Your car is skidding on ice, God forbid, but it's happening in snow time. Don't say, oh, my God, I'm dead. You're not dead. He say, save me. He say, Hosanna. Say, in the name of Jesus, save me, Lord. Amen. You learn something from that? Praise God. So as I said, yeah, I cast out, you know, and the people I live with, they just, that's how they are, and it's affected me. Oh, my God, help me out. And I like that. You know, uh, when he admitted, God, I need help, God sent an angel to take that which would cleanse him, fire, coals from the presence of God touched his lips. Amen. And God said, I've sanctified you, and you're going to prophesy. You're going to speak for me. Amen. I don't know if you agree with me, but yeah, I think I'll be bold enough to say even Scripture agrees with me. I think he was, he was the greatest of the prophets, Isaiah. Because in the book of Romans, Paul says, Paul quotes Isaiah. He says, you know, the people of Israel, they were rebellious. They were hard-headed hard 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 and all that, stubborn. And God said, all day long, through the prophet Isaiah, this is all day long, I stretch out my arms to you. And you're obstinate. You won't listen. But the people who don't know me, they will turn to me. I'll go to the Gentiles and they will turn to me. Isaiah said that. Paul quotes it. And what Paul quoted it, Paul said, Moses was bold in calling out the people of Israel and their sins. Moses was bold. 
But Paul said Isaiah was very bold. Look at that, the difference. Moses is bold to call them out. But Isaiah is very bold. So who's higher in that sense? Isaiah, yeah? I'm just supporting with scripture. Also, when you really look at it, he was the one prophet who, who was detailed in expounding, declaring and expounding on the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Especially when you study Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. Two chapters. Isaiah 52, you got to start from verse 13 towards the end of Isaiah 52. If I was writing it, I would not split 52 and 53. I would just go from 52 and make it a long chapter into 53. Just make it one. Because Isaiah 52 is really part of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 52, let me show you. Let me just show you that quickly. I'll just show you that. Isaiah 52, go to verse 13. Please. Isaiah 52. Are you in verse 13 in your Bible? Isaiah 52, verse 13. If you don't have a Bible, turn to your phone and put it in. It'll, tell, it'll give you 5213. Look on the screen right now. It says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. I'm not going to turn to the other reference I'm about to give you. But if you're taking notes, what you just read in Isaiah 52 verse 13 can be expounded on by Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11. Why don't I just teach? <laughs> Why don't I just teach? <laughs> All right? <laughs> All right, let me just do a teaching. Go to Isaiah, excuse me, go to Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let's go. You there? Come on, let's go. Philippians 2, please. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. What we're about to read, that Jesus did be exactly like that. Are you following? Yes, no, maybe, I don't get it. Are you following? No. Are you following? Yes. Are you following? Ah. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Even if you don't understand it, all he's saying is, whatever Christ did, you do the same. Do you agree? Okay, we go on. Verse 6. Who, Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So Jesus, before he became Jesus here on earth, was with God and was equal to God. Are you with me? Verse 7. But made himself of no reputation. So he was something before he made himself without that what he was. Yes? He made himself of no reputation. So he had to be before he became the other. We good? Verse 7. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Before he took the form of a servant, he was not a servant. But he was something before he could take the form of a servant. Are we good on that? Okay. And was made in the likeness of men. So he was not a man, but became a man. And before he became a man, he was something, but not a man. Hello? All right. I'll just let the Bible speak for itself. I'm not going to tell you what he was. You figure it out yourself. Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So verse 7, what does he become in verse 7? He took on the form of a what? A servant. Do you remember Isaiah 52, verse 13? My servant. One verse is being expounded on 
by maybe seven or eight verses. From Philippians 2, 5 all the way through 11. Now, where am I? Where did I end in Philippians 2? Where did I end? Somebody tell me, please. Verse 7, uh, verse 8, right? Did I read, and being found in fashion as a man? Okay, so that, is that verse 8? We got it? Okay. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So it's very specific. What death? Death on the cross. He was not martyred. Jesus was a substitute. There's a difference between dying as a martyr and dying as a substitute. Write that in your notes. Jesus was a substitute. He died a substitutionary death. He died in our place. He died for us. Amen. Amen. He took our sins. He became us so we could become him. Somebody can die as a martyr, but does not take away your sins. Are we good? Okay. Verse 9, is it? Okay, Philippians 2, 9. Thank you. Wherefore, because of what he has done, Wherefore, therefore, God also highly exalted him. Highly exalted him. Remember Isaiah 52, 13. My servant shall be exalted. My servant shall be extolled. Servant exalted. Usually servants aren't exalted. Come on. You can't be a servant if you're exalted. You're either a servant or you're not. Yes? Yes? Somebody has a, like a huge estate. He's a master there and he has servants. Are the servants the master? Is the owner of the estate the servant? No. But somehow God is able to make a servant a master. <laughs> only God. Somebody say only God. Amen. Okay. Philippians 2 verse 9. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him and what? Given him a name which is above every name. That other name of Jesus, literally at the mention of the name of Jesus, at the invocation of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things, instead of things, you could say beings, spirit beings, that is, of things in heaven, that would be angels in heaven. Things in the earth and things under the earth. Under the earth refers to the realm of darkness, spiritual world. Realm of darkness, the demonic world, the satanic world. Also the world of child trafficking, the world of, you know, murder, all those evil things that happen. Jesus' name is above all that. Amen. The world of oppression, the oppression of a people by another group. The name of Jesus is over that. Amen. When he rules on earth, he says they shall learn war no more. Amen. So war is not of God. Therefore, let's pray against wars today. Even though we'll still have them on our, in our world, let's still pray against them till we go to heaven. Finally, Philippians 2, verse 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, is Lord to the glory of God. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, same way as the people gave glory to Jesus on Palm Sunday, we see here in Philippians 2 that glory must be given to Jesus. Amen. Come back now to Isaiah 52. What verse, please? Isaiah 52. What was the first verse I gave you there, please? At least those in church. 13. Thank you. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Is that Philippians 2? Amen. The highest name, the much less name of Jesus. Verse 14. And as many were astonished... At thee, at God's suffering servant, his form, his face, his visage was marred more than any man. 
So nobody has been bloodied, beating, face busted quite like Jesus. We're good? According to the scripture. Nobody's face has become more grotesque than that of Jesus. Ever. I'll tell you why. Tell you why. The reason is because he was not only physically beating, but spiritually something was happening to him. The people, tragically, unfortunately, sadly, in our world of wickedness, who have been lynched, bludgeoned to death. Horrible. I'm not making light of that at all. But compared to Jesus, in the case of Jesus, pay attention, this is important for your healing, for your deliverance. In the case of Jesus, when his face was being beaten in, spiritually something was happening. What was happening was that the shame that is on us was being placed on Jesus so that the glory that is his would become ours. Do you get it? Forgive me for giving a natural example. That's not even the best, but at least it helps our minds to kind of understand better. I know you get it, but there may be somebody who doesn't get it. Do you know that in our world, there have been people who have died, who have fought their, for their country, like for independence. They fought for their country to save their country. Come on, people. Right. You know that, right? Okay. Like soldiers, you know, people who serve in the military in different countries, including the United States, they actually protect us. Do you know that? The people who serve, they, they fight, defend us. I go to sleep and somebody is fighting that I would be safe. I mean, that, that, that's, God bless them. God bless them. There's a fire in a building and somebody's going to go to save people. I mean, God bless people like that. Think about it. Somebody's fighting, you know, God forbid, but there's domestic abuse. People are fighting and then somebody calls 911. They call the police and the police are coming and they have no idea what's behind those walls. Scariest thing, can I even say it? Uh, okay, well, I don't know. But I, hap I happened to find out uh, not too long ago, some time back, that not too far from where we live, everybody in the community, every house, there's a gun in every house. But one house. Seriously. I was like, wait a minute. This is, for those who are, you know, in different other parts of the world, um, I, I, you know, this, I'm talking about Virginia, the, the, the state of Virginia in the United States. And this particular area, every house, I mean, this, this, that's not normal. Every house, there's, like, there's only one house in the community. Let's say, I don't know, maybe 100 houses more but let's say that out of a hundred only one house I was shocked there, there is no way you can take this country you know because you have to overcome was it the marines uh, uh, the navy you gotta overcome the army you gotta overcome coast guard you gotta overcome and then I, after all that you gotta deal with the citizens everybody's armed I was like my god that is, America is scary, man. Don't joke with this country. I leave all of that alone. This is, I was shocked. <laughs> but I was thinking privately to myself, after Russia attacked Ukraine, I'm, I was like, you know, everybody's got to be armed, you know. Please, I know I'm pastor and this is church. Don't take, don't take my gospel. I was just thinking. You know, things happen and it makes you think. I was thinking to myself, I was like, Max, <laughs> I was like, I kid you, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I 
was like, if France arms the Cote d'Ivoire <laughs> and they go after Ghana, what's Ghana going to do? I, I was like, wait a minute. This world, this world, it's not easy, man. You got to believe in God. Think about it. You are Ukraine. You, I mean, I know they got their history, they got stuff. But I'm a regular person. I live in my life in Ukraine. And all of a sudden, oh, my God. So I started to think, I was like, wait a minute, maybe, maybe I got to find some, you know, is it AR, AR-37, AK-47, whatever, AR-13s. I, I, I kid you not. I started thinking. I was like, man, I got I to gotta find something because you just never know. And then I said, wait a minute, okay. No, before they're able to, to conquer Marines, the army, I went through all of them, even Coast Guard. Forgive me if you're Coast Guard. But I never really thought like Coast Guard are like, like tough, you know, but excuse me. So I was like, I went down, I said, okay, okay, Coast Guard. And then, uh, then they have to come to my neighborhood. You know, before they get to my neighborhood, they had to deal with, oh, e no, there's no way. All right, so I'm not getting any AK-47. That's only because I'm behind the pulpit. Ask me after, after I, I go out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Isaiah 53. Let's learn some scriptures. Let's learn. Some. Man. Okay, Isaiah 53. Uh, he was bloodied more than anybody. Man, verse 14. And it's formed more than the sons of men. Verse 15. So watch 15. I need you to notice something in 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. So now Isaiah is not talking about God's servant for Israel only. Now he says many nations. Amen. And kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which has not been told them shall they see. And that which... They have not heard, shall they consider? All right? Now, I was telling you, this is what I would have done. I would not have put chapter 53 there. I would have continued my thought because it continues. God didn't say, Isaiah, Isaiah, right, this is chapter one, chapter two. No, 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 no. Those chapters there, people put it there. We need it because it helps us follow. Because at least you can check out what I'm saying. Yes? I, can, I have to give you a specific verse so you can follow. If I was just rattling off, you would not be able to find, you know, where it is. Also, Bibles come in different sizes. Some are large, some are small print. So I can't give you a page number because page numbers are all different. So it helps us to have chapters and verses. You understand? But when you are studying, you have to look for the, the flow of the Spirit. Are you with me? Okay, the flow of the Spirit here is this. From Isaiah 52, 13, the thought flows into 53, 1. And goes on till the end of 53. In fact, it doesn't even end in 53. It goes into 54. Because 54 talks about after his death and resurrection, the blessings that come, the fruitfulness that come. He goes into 54 and he says, all of a sudden he says, somebody who was barren is no longer barren. He's just telling you that when the Messiah comes, he gives us God's life and life more abundantly. Amen. Where you lacked, the Messiah will change that lack. Did you get that? Okay. So Isaiah goes into Isaiah 53 and verse 1, he says, Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of the Lord revealed here means God's power is going to work in your life. Do you get this? Okay. Our report, our plural. Isaiah is saying, I'm, I gave a report and prophets like me also gave a report. We good? Okay. And their report is about one person. The person is Jesus. Verse 2. For he, Jesus, shall grow up before God as a tender plant. 
and as a root out of a dry ground. If you got a tree growing from a dry ground, do you think it will be fruitful? All right, for those of you who are in church, this is not a trick question. You got a tree growing in a dry ground. Will it be fruitful? No. Right? No. So God gives himself a problem. God's trying to grow a tree in dry ground. He gives himself a problem. But with God, nothing shall be impossible. And God wants you and I to be like him. Those of us who trust in God, even if you, like Jesus, you came out of a dry ground from the south side of Chicago or from Anacostia, no disrespect, I'm just talking about history. Just no disrespect, not dis disrespecting Chicago or Anacostia for those of us in the Washington area or in the United States who are aware. But the point of it is this. If you are from a place that is discarded, disrespected, just like when Jesus came as a prophet, somebody said, we found, we found Jesus, the Messiah of whom the prophet spoke about, you know, and then another guy says, where is he from? And they said, oh, Nazareth. And he was like, wait a minute. Wait a, wait a minute, Nazareth? You, you, you want to tell me we've been waiting this long for a Messiah and you're telling me Messiah is from Nazareth? What? Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But God chose the discarded place to bring glory in that place. And I have come to tell you on this Palm Sunday that those who have been abused, who have been rejected, God is going to make your life glorious so that he will get the glory. Somebody give him praise. With God, nothing shall be impossible. A root out of a dry ground became the Messiah. Hallelujah. Even where he was born, physically born in Bethlehem. If you read the Bible, I love scripture. Man, he says, thou Bethlehem of Ephrata, though thou be little, little among the thousands of Judah, the little cities of, you know, you little of all the many cities out of you shall come the Messiah. He was not born in Jerusalem. You would think that if you want a Messiah to save the world, you go to the religious capital of the world at that time, Jerusalem. No, 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 no. Bethlehem. He was not born in a palace. He was born among bleating sheep. In a manger. Only God. He will make something special from your life for his glory. Somebody give God praise. To those who sat in darkness, great light has sprung up. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome it. No wonder the normal street people, regular people, when they heard Jesus was coming, they took out palm branches and they are waving it from the Old Testament. Palm branches were used in, in, in celebration. They were used to say, we have triumphed. They were used to say, praise the Lord. He is with us. He has delivered us from Egypt. He has delivered us from the Assyrians. He has delivered us from the Medopetians. He has delivered us from the Grecians. And he has delivered us from the Romans. Glory be to God. And that was what they were saying that Palm Sunday. But as I taught you, their only mistake was that they only thought for, that they would have deliverance from physical oppression. They were not thinking that they have deliverance from spiritual oppression. Oppression, But I showed you from Isaiah 52 that he will sprinkle his blood on the nations. Come on, people. Are you seeing this? Amen. The Israelites thought the Messiah is for just Israel. God says he's for everybody. We good? Okay. Amen. All right. So. 
me show you just a couple of verses in Isaiah 53 to put together with Isaiah 52, as I've been doing before I move away. Isaiah 52, remember verse 13, he said he's a servant. Yes? And the servant will be exalted. That's Jesus. Yes? Okay. So let's see in Isaiah 53 how that flows into servanthood. So the thought flows is the same thought flow. It does not end in just 52. All right, but it goes to 53. Let's go to Isaiah 53 and verse 8. Isaiah 53, verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. All right, so this person, what happened to him, it was for the sins of Isaiah's people, the people of Israel, of course, as well as our sins. We good? Okay. Now, same as Isaiah 52, he sprinkled many nations. So we see that in verse 8. Now verse 9, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. So whoever this person is, the day he will die, he will die among wicked people. And when he's buried, he'll be buried in a place that was owned by a rich person. We good? Okay. When Jesus was crucified, there were two wicked people on either side of him, at least two people that are mentioned in the Bible, yes? The thieves on the cross, yes? Okay. And then he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man. You see what Isaiah is saying? Happened exactly as Isaiah said. Let's read on. Verse 9, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. I already said that there was no guile in his mouth. He didn't deceive anybody. He's ne never sent. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet he without sin. Amen? He bore our sins, so we'll bear his righteousness. Are we good? Okay, let's go on. Isaiah 53, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord God to bruise him. He, the Lord God, has put him, Jesus, to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. So Jesus was a martyr. He was a sin offering. Amen. He was a substitute. He died vicariously in our place. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It was God's good pleasure. Wow. Only love would do this. Divine love. It was God's good pleasure that Jesus will be made sin for us, sick for us, oppressed for us, so that we will not be oppressed, we will not be made sick, we will not have sin dominating our lives. I know you know these things, but you have to remind yourself of these things. You have to go back in the word of God. You have to read it over and over again. I shared a testimony with you the other day, and, and what... I didn't emphasize this part of the testimony, but what I love about the testimony was that this, this uh, family member who had breast cancer there in Africa, and I prayed for her one Sunday after service in the office. We had an appointment, prayed for her. And two subsequent Sundays after that, so three Sundays in a row, on the two subsequent Sundays, I had uh, two or three of the ministers join me to pray. And I love that about this church. I'm praying and they just joined in. <laughs> you know, this is pretty cool. I love that. But what I didn't tell you was this. Prior to the first meeting, the first uh, prayer meeting, prayer conference over the phone, 
I gave us scriptures from Isaiah 53, what I've just been reading to you. Isaiah 53, look at verses 4 and 5. And I said this to her in particular. You may know these things, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to read these scriptures every day for one week before I pray for you on Sunday. This is what I said to her. And then texted her before prayer and said, did you read it? And she said, I've been reading it faithfully every day. All the scriptures. I gave her, you can write it down. I gave her Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. I gave her 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25. This is the order. Please write it down. It's important. I said, this is what we're going to do. The word of God is going to dislodge the cancer out of your body. But you got to promise me, you're going to read these scriptures every day. That is your tablets. That is the gospel, your, your pills that you're going to be taking. I, I said Isaiah 53, and I, take, I wrote them all out. Isaiah, you know, you, we have what they have. They have what they call WhatsApp. You can WhatsApp people. You know, you, you just, I send it over the phone. That's good enough. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. First Peter 2, 24 and 25. Please pay attention to the order. Matthew chapter 8, 14 to 17. Gave her that. Said these scriptures you got to read together with Jeremiah 30 and verse 17. I, I will restore health to you. I want you to read them in this order. And you will, you see, I want you to see yourself healed. I want you to see the word of God removing what God is not planting you out of you and restoring health to you. If you don't read it, I will not pray for you on Sunday. Because, see, yeah, some, I wouldn't say this to everybody, but there's something you can say to family. Yeah, you know, we know ourselves. Yeah, you get this. Because I, I knew this. You see, some people depend on your prayer, but they're not, they're not dependent on the word. So they're like, oh, you know, I got this. Yeah, of course, I got a personal connection with my family member. I can call him anytime, and he's this anointed man. He's going to pray for me. He's prayed for other people that got healed. If you pray for people who are not related to him and they got healed, me, I call him anytime. God, you know, God's going to do it. So to get away from all that, I said, you got to read these verses every day for one week. Otherwise, I'm not praying for you. I will not tell anybody that. But I told a family member that. So Saturday before the Sunday, first, I said, did you read the scripture? She said, faithfully. I read every day. I said, good. So Sunday we prayed. And I said, next Sunday, we're going to pray again. For the next seven days, I want you to read the same scriptures, but each three them three times, breakfast, lunch, dinner, three times a day. Will you do that? She said, yes. Okay. I said, all right, then we'll pray. So the next Sunday, I think it was uh, the time I closed. Well, it was the end of the service. And. We're sitting out chatting, and, you know, I called because I had an appointment with her, and I called, and I prayed, and they just joined. And I think the third week was uh, Minister Helen. I, for I forgot who, but anyway, God bless you for joining in. But I didn't tell you that I'd given her the scripture, so you need to know this. You need to put the word in there. It is the word that heals. It is the word that delivers. It is the word that saves. Being born again by the incorruptible seed the word of God, which lives and abides forever. 1 Peter 1, 23. It is the word of God that saves us. He sent his word, and his word healed his people and delivered them from their destructions. Psalm 107, verse 20. God will send his word. Again, Isaiah 55. Isaiah said that as the rain comes down from heaven, as the snow comes, waters the earth so that it has moisture. So if you sow, you will reap. So shall my word be, which goes out of my mouth. It will go and do what I send the word to do. It will prosper in it. I knew that she did not need to depend on me and look to me as a minister. I wanted to, as, a, as like, you know, the man of God. And, you know, back, back, back there in our culture, back there, back home, Ministers are revered. So I knew the focus was on me and not on the word. And I needed to get away. 
from me to Christ. And God healed her. I didn't lay hands on her. We're a different continent. God healed her. God did it to the glory of God. Isaiah 53, what verses? Online, 4 and 5. 1 Peter 2, what verses? 24, 25. You remember Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. 1 Peter 2, 24, 25. 4, 5. You know, you remember that. Matthew 8, 14 to 17. Are you with me? Jeremiah 30, verse 17. I said, you got to do that. Second week, you got to take it as like pills. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. Three times a day. Read it three times. Then the third week, I said, whenever you read, stop. Each one, stop. And just think about what you just read. It's called meditation. But before we do all that meditation stuff and it's too high for you, don't worry about it. Just read one. Just think about it. A little bit, like five minutes. Read the next one. Think, just do that. You're going to do that? She said, yes. Amen. God healed her. Healed her. Gone. Amen. To God be the glory. Since we are in Isaiah, look at it, verses 4 and 5. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. You need to commit this to memory. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Smitten of God. It pleased God to bruise him. It was not the Romans who killed Jesus, nor was it the Jews who killed Jesus. Jesus gave his life and God Put our sins on Jesus. God put our sicknesses on Jesus. God put our shame on Jesus. God set us free because God loves us. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Palm Sunday does you no good. And Easter Sunday does you no good. And all these religious stuff, they won't do you any good until you understand that Jesus did not die for Jesus. Jesus died for you. Jesus was raised up not for Jesus. Jesus was raised up for you. He was already God. He didn't need to be raised up. He is God. He was raised up for you. Are you with me? All right, before I look at this scripture, there's another final point I need to make before we go back to the scripture. And this is this final point that you need to get today. You understand Palm Sunday, Easter Sunday, all of that, the cross was for us. You with me? Okay. God sent Jesus to die for your sins. Raised him up for you. You with me? All right. Here is our problem in human life. Here is our problem. Instead of accepting what God has done for us in Christ, we live our lives waiting to accept ourselves when people accept us. We live our lives waiting to feel approved when people approve of us. Please bear with me. Don't be mad at me. I'm trying to help you take you somewhere. It's a little high, but it's God's way and you get it. All right. Let me give you, take an example in America right now, because we are aware of it, I'm sure other people are aware of it around the world. But right now, America just came through a black woman, all right, now being put on the highest court of this country, the Supreme Court, a black woman. Praise the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a shout. Amen. Now, that should have happened a long time ago because if you're looking for the highest court to represent the people, then you have to get a representation of the people on the court. It's just very simple. That should have been done a long time ago. But it wasn't done. Thank God it's been done now. We good? Okay. Good. Now, this, is, this should be in the position of the nation and of the people. 
we, we don't wait for approval from anybody to feel approved. <sighs> Some things are hard sometimes to teach because people misunderstand you. You know, they don't get where you're, where you're trying to teach them. Uh, I'll give you another example. Personally, personally, I don't like the word colored or the phrase colored people. I don't, personally, I don't like that. I detest it. Even the, if you can, he, you can hear the anger, even in my voice right now. I can feel every fiber of my being rejecting it. I've never accepted it. Never and will never accept it. Why? Because I'm from heaven. Our citizenship is of heaven. Philippians 3 says our citizenship is of heaven. We are born again not by the will of man, John chapter 1, but by the will of God. Ladies and gentlemen, God so loved you that he identified with you so you could identify with him. Your identification is in God. Your identification is not in man. It is not in what man says. Now we can give you a position. A glorious high throne from the foundation of the world has been our position. A glorious high throne. Jeremiah 17, 12. A glorious high throne has been our place. From the foundation of the world. I don't wait for you to put me on the Supreme Court before I feel like I'm somebody. I was somebody before you were born. You have to know who you are in Christ. Whether you're black, you're brown, you're black, whatever it is, you have to know who you are in Christ. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. You see this, the title of my message, Isaiah 61 Verses 1 to 3, you see it right there. Isaiah 61, 1 to 3, it says, The Spirit of the Lord, of the Lord God is upon me. That is Jesus. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jubilee has come. Your emancipation came from Jesus. It didn't come from any president of the United States of America. It came from Jesus Christ. Our emancipation was proclaimed according to Isaiah 61 and Leviticus 25 verse 10. It was proclaimed by the Lord God. I don't wait for men to approve me. The Bible says you are accepted in the beloved. You are qualified. God has qualified me. I don't need your acceptance. I know who I am in Christ Jesus. I'm the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are forgiven. You are washed. You are sanctified. You are exalted. You are lifted up. You are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are above and you are above only. That is your position. And when you accept that God has placed you there, then everything about you begins to rise up to that position. Creation will help you to get there. Human beings will have, have, to, have to work hard to get you there because that is where you already are. In spirit, that is what he has made you. Then you have to get your soul to agree with where your spirit is. Then you have to get your body to agree with what, where your spirit is. And so are. When there's that agreement, then creation says, oh my God, this is what we have been waiting for. We have been waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. We have been waiting for the arising up of the sons of God. And according to Romans 8, when creation sees that, creation rises up to assist you. 
angels rejoice when you are born again. Hebrews 1 says, angels wait to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. We inherit salvation. We have inherited what God has. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. If you are a child of the living God, you are an heir of God, how dare you wait to accept yourself only when a human being approves of you? That is what I have a problem with, with this culture. Teach your children that. Teach our grandchildren that. Don't wait to accept yourself because a human being accepts you. Know that God Almighty has accepted you. Give him praise, somebody. Oh, hallelujah. Do you think that Prince William feels good about himself because people accept him? No. He grew up knowing that he is royalty. Every fiber of his being says, I am royal. And the rest of you all bow to his sense of worth. And we bask in their glory and in their presence. A mere human being. Just because he knows who he is. And you are a child of the living God. This is what the people felt on that Sunday as Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem. They are like, oh God. What you said in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, that the prince is entering, riding on a donkey, coming to save his people. My God, we feel it. It's happening. Jesus did not tell them, guys, it's about to happen. No. No. Pastor Sandra, it was not even like the day in, in Nazareth, in the synagogue, where Jesus is reading Isaiah 61, and after he read it, everybody's looking at him like, is that, is that really, the, is this, is it happening? And Jesus said, yes, this day, the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. They could sense it. You mean, I, I'm, I'm going to be free? totally debt free on the day of emancipation it meant that you were completely debt free ladies and gentlemen the thing is that you have to accept who you are in Christ to become it in the natural does, does that make sense this word of God is helping you pay attention helping you discover who you already are do you understand me you are a new creation in Christ. Created not because you said a sinner's prayer. Mama wife, pastor, no, Bishop James Affo. To be Bishop elect. You and Bishop Hesrifi. Bishop elect. Follow me, sir. <laughs> created by God you are the handiwork of God do you know how much people are paying from for art pieces today we have gone away from just an a literal art piece physically drawn by Michelangelo or, or Monet or help me another name yes today they call NFTs today it is digital prints that you've, you never see, and people are paying millions for it. Somebody's handiwork. And the Bible says you are God's masterpiece. You know when we were created? Not the day you said the sinner's prayer. We were created in Christ. That's the Sunday, Palm Sunday, the week before the resurrection of Jesus. They could sense that what God had said was about to happen. 
How do we know that? Doesn't the Bible say that to Simeon, the old man, and Anna, the prophetess, the old lady praying always in the temple, to Simeon, God revealed, you will not die till you see the Lord's Christ. He sat in his home, his, his house, and something tells him. I don't know if something has ever told you. Something told him. It was a spirit said, go to the temple now. It's about to happen. And he goes to the temple. Mary doesn't say anything. Joseph doesn't say anything. He is drawn to this baby as they are dedicating the baby, presenting the baby to the Lord. And he says, Jehovah, Jehovah, let now your servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. Did we not hear a man also see something of it and declare to us in the history of the United States that his eyes had seen the glory of the Lord. He saw something many people did not see. I lived here and heard, heard some of the leaders say when President Obama became president, they said, we never thought we'd see this day. Leaders who are with him, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, back in those days, I heard them say, we never thought we'd see this day. Yet he saw it. He said, I've been on the mountaintop and I've seen the glory. I have seen that one day my, white, my black son and a white person will walk hand in hand. I can see them walking in love in this country. I'm telling you what will save America and save the world is the love of Jesus Christ. It is not our military might or power. It is the love of God that will save your house. That will save humanity. It is God's love. And this love is for all the nations. This love is for everybody. That is what the people were crying out for on Palm Sunday. May your palms be lifted up in praise to God. May your hands be lifted up to show forth the praises, the splendor of the living God who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light to show forth his praises. Give him praise, somebody. Hallelujah. So he says in Isaiah 61, verse 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. Instead of the ashes of defeat, there's going to be glory all around you and over you. Says the Lord, who does these things? The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise instead of the spirit of depression or heaviness. Why? So that they might be called what? So that they be called what? Trees of righteousness. Righteousness. What is that? Right standing with God. Because of who? Because of Jesus Christ and his shed blood for all humanity. That was a cry. That's, that's what Palm Sunday is about. Save us, Lord, but he has come to save you. So now we lift our hands and say, thank you for saving us. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for delivering us. This is what I needed to get my family member to look into the word to see what God had done. And believe what God had done based on the word of God, not based on the fact that I'm an anointed minister. Anointed by who? Jesus. So you go to Jesus. K K did I help you today? You are the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. We are trees. Palm trees. What does a palm tree represent? Righteousness. The palm tree represents uprightness. Upright means righteous. Amen. The righteousness of God. According to 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. God has made Jesus sin for us. Jesus who knew no sin. That we might be what? Made what? The righteousness of God in Christ. You have made it. You are already made it. 
You are made right. It is not how long your gown, your robe, your skirt is. No, it is not how many times you fast in a week, though fasting is good. It's not how many prayer uh, groups you are on at midnight praying, even though prayer is good. It is not all the things we're being told we need to do to become. You don't need all those things. You need to identify with him who identified with you and already made you righteous. Do you get this? You are the righteousness of God, created in your spirit by God. Your spirit connects with God's spirit. The only part of you God deals directly with is your spirit, not your mind, not your body, directly with your spirit. It is your spirit that got born again, that got eternal life. That got changed. Why? If you bear with me to use this phrase, it is because when Adam sinned, listen, Adam became born again by the devil. Yes. Did it shake you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Born again doesn't mean I'm a Christian. Born again just means that you are born again. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Don't get religious on me now. <laughs> Born. Beth. Again. Again means what? It's happened previously. Yes? Adam was a child of God. Yes? Then he got born by the devil. You didn't, you didn't know that? You thought he just did something wrong. No, he didn't do something wrong. He lost the nature of God that was in him, and he got the nature of the devil. I know some people are like, wait, I thought born again means I'm a Christian. No, 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 no. Born again means you've been born a second time. Adam was born first by God. Don't get confused now. <laughs> Adam was born first by God. Then he was born a second time, not by God, but by the devil. Then that nature, bless you, that nature passed on all of us. Adam died spiritually. Why? Because death is the nature of the devil. In God, there is no death. In God, there is only life. Adam got the nature of the devil, which he passed on all of us. Therefore, Jesus needed to make us born a second time because we had all been born the first time by the devil. Come on! That is why you needed to be born again because you had been born the first time by your father, the devil. Ms. Ross, are you seeing this? If people will catch this, then everything about you, the moment you catch it, in my spirit, the devil's nature is gone. I no longer have the spirit of bondage. Now, Romans 8, 15, I have the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, <laughs> Give him praise. Therefore, he has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts to let us know he that has the son has eternal life. The believer is not trying to believe. He is a believer. The believer is not trying to obtain. You are a possessor. You are an owner. He that believeth has. We have had the Supreme Court all along. We have had the White House all along. But the, it wasn't coming because we were waiting for approval by man before we could get there. But you have to force humanity to come along with you for you to enjoy what God has already given to you. You have to force creation to rise up, to support you, to bring you to where you already are. And so, your spirit 
now has the spirit of God. Your mind has to accept that. Your emotions have to accept that. Your will has to accept that. Then your body has to line up. When your body and your soul line up with where your spirit is, then everything in your environment begins to line up. That is how come before Jesus sat on that donkey, Jesus could say to the disciples, go to that place. You're going to see a fork in the road. And it still exists today. The town where there's a fork in the road. At that junction, you're going to find a donkey on which nobody ever sat to fulfill Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 and 10. They knew they had been taught these scriptures, so they knew that. He said, go. And when you go, the owner, the, the person who bought the donkey, is going to ask you, why are you releasing my donkey? Tell him. Pay attention, she said, the master has need of it. Doesn't it surprise you that when the disciples got there and they started releasing the little donkey, the baby donkey, the, the, the foal, nobody ever sat on it, all right? Because the master has to sit on it first. Yes? <laughs> okay. So they're releasing it. I, have, I used to marvel at it till the Lord showed me this. I said, wow, wait a minute. I own this car. Somebody comes and is taking my car. And I'm like, hey, why are you taking my car? And he said, oh, the master wants your car. And I just let it go. What? What are you talking about? Why would he do that? Because the owner of the universe had spoken. The donkey knew. And the steward, the man who owned the donkey, knew he was only an administrator. He was only a steward. It's like me, called to teach something. Who gave me the gift? Jesus. Not me. It's Jesus. That is why you have to point people to Jesus and not you. Amen. The master, the owner of the donkey released it because he acknowledged that the real owner had stepped in. When you take your position as the real owner, all who are administrators will release whatever it is that's actually yours to come to you. And this is what I need you to get all around the world and in this sanctuary. Healing is yours. Victory is yours. You are planted by the Lord that he will get the glory. The splendor of his glory will be made known by you. That you will display his glory. Do you think that God will plant you to display his glory and just watch you to be destroyed? No. No. You and I are humans. Whatever we invest in, we protect. And you think your father will let you be destroyed? No. Healing is yours. Strength is yours. Vitality is yours. Long life is yours. Somebody lift your hand and receive it. In the name of Jesus, strength to you, life to you, health to you. I speak long life to you. In the name of Jesus, may your bones receive life. May your tissues receive life. May your ligaments receive life. In the name of Jesus, somebody with a problem with your waist. In fact, you have the pain right now. God's healing you. In the name of Jesus, maybe you are online or even in the sanctuary. Begin to act on on it. Begin to do something that you could not do. If you could not bend, start bending and raise yourself up. Like a palm tree, raise yourself up. Raise yourself up and stand straight. Lift your hands up in praise to God. Your waist is healed. Your back is healed. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, be made whole. In Jesus' matchless name, by the faith of the living God, I call it done. Receive your breakthrough. Let everything around you now work in your favor.
Let creation work in your favor. Let kings and queens serve you. Let them rise up to serve you. In the name of Jesus. That donkey that is supposed to carry you into the place of your exaltation. Let that donkey be released to you. In the name of Jesus. The day of your coronation has come. The day for you to be celebrated has come. That vehicle that is taking you to the Supreme Court, to the White House, to Congress, to the CEO level, to whatever that God has ordained for you. That donkey, that vessel, that vehicle, may that respond to your call as you rise up in spirit and call it into your life for the fulfillment of your divine purpose and destiny. I pray this for you and for your children. I pray this for you and your grandchildren. I pray this for you and your family members. Receive it right now, online, in the church, around the world. Receive it. I pray for you. I pray for your loved ones. In the name of the Lord Jesus, may your life be to the praise and the honor of the Lord God. May your life be lifted up, your hands be lifted up, your life be lifted up to display God's glory, to display God's glory. You are saved to display the glory of God. You are for the splendor of God to be displayed everywhere. The aroma of his love, of his power and his glory to be spread out everywhere that people will smell the scent of God's life. Oh, in Jesus' name, be a blessing to many. Be a blessing to many. The Lord blesses you today and makes you a blessing to many. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I see your hands lifted up in praise to God. I see your heart and your life lifted up in praise to God. You are that palm tree of righteousness, of uprightness, of integrity. I see that in the name of Jesus. The palm tree is high because you are high. It represents those who are high, who are lifted up, seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. The palm tree is high because it represents those who are high in the Lord. The palm tree is upright because it represents the upright ones of God, the righteous ones of God. That's who you are in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Every part of the palm tree can be used. It's beneficial for humanity. You are a blessing to humanity. God has made you a blessing. I want you to receive it before I end the service today. He has made you a blessing. He has made you a blessing. You are already a blessing. You are blessed to be a blessing. That's what it is. You are already healed. You are not going to be healed. You are already healed. Accept that. Then your cells will join you. Then your blood will join you. Then everything about you will join you. And even your doctor will say, oh, I'm amazed. I can't believe this. The records, your charts, the x-rays, your blood work. I can't, whoa, what happened to you? What happened to you? It is because finally you accepted who God has already made you. Your life is on display, displaying his splendor. Can you accept that today? Can you receive it? In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, may everything around you, Work together for your good. In the matchless name of Jesus, I sense it's done. Amen. Give God praise. It's done. It's done. It's done. Give God praise, somebody. Give God praise all over the world. Give God praise. It's just a time to praise God. No, not a struggle. It's already done. Give God praise. Hallelujah. 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 To God be the glory, 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 to God be the glory. I said to God be the glory. Hallelujah. I love you, church. God bless you so much. Amen. Yeah, next week we'll study some more. But you know, he said it's finished. So it's finished. You got to thank him for it. Yes. Hallelujah. 
God bless you so much. Woo, glory to God. Praise God. Everybody online, next Sunday, please get bread and wine. All right, don't get drunk before the service now, but we're going to have communion together. <laughs> All right, so get, get uh, bread and wine or get, you know, if you have crackers in your house and grape juice, that, that's fine. Next Sunday, we have communion together on Easter, what is called Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we have communion together. I want to pray for your finances as we give to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, receive our worship, specifically the worship of our tithes, our offerings, our gifts of love. We give out of love, we give in faith, we give. This is our gratitude, this is our thanks given to you. Through our high priest, Jesus Christ, our Lord, receive our worship in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for receiving us and receiving our worship. And thank you for the corresponding return on all our seed sown and all our giving in Jesus name. Oh, amen. 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 God bless you. You can give online. Uh, electronically by Zell Transfer to World Missions Ministries. The number for Zell Transfer, this is Zell Transfer only, is 571 234 2387. I repeat, the number for Zell Transfer is 571 234 2387 to World Missions Ministries. You can give online via PayPal. Via PayPal, just go to our website, which is wmmchurch.org. wmmchurch.org.org. And click on the donate button. There's a red donate button. Just click it, click on it. And if you choose to give via PayPal, you can give that way. Finally, you can send a check in the mail to World Missions Ministries. The address is 6805 East Clinton Street, Clinton, Maryland, 20735, and that's USA. I repeat the address for World Missions Ministries, 6805 East Clinton Street, Clinton, Maryland, 20735, that's USA. Thank you, and the Lord bless you as you give. This ends our online service. Please remember, get your communion with you next Sunday at 12 sharp. We will have communion together right after the word. All right? God bless you. we we'll see you next Sunday for church service at 11 a.m. The word will start promptly at 11 a.m. Thank you. God bless.